Good morning, Vanguard. Good morning. Welcome to you. If you're new in the house, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, we're talking today about the great calling that Jesus has on each of our lives and the great commission that he has on each of our lives. And this morning, Jan, where are you in the house? Are you in here? Uh, there you are. Jan said, I want to tell you a story. And she said, uh, she started, she said, you know, Billy Graham, how many people know who Billy Graham is? Okay. Billy Graham's the greatest probably evangelist, uh, English speaking evangelist of our time, maybe in the history of the world. And he's gone to be with the Lord. Uh, and Billy Graham told his chauffeur, I've always wanted to drive a limousine. And the chauffeur was like, sure, I'll get in the back and you can get up front. And so Billy Graham drove the, uh, the chauffeur's limousine and he started speeding. <laughs> and an officer had to stop him and he came up to the window and when he looked in, he went, whoa. He went back to his dispatcher and he said, hey, I know sometimes that we like to give celebrities a bit of a break when they break the law right? And they said, sure, who is it that's driving? He said, uh, well, uh, it's Billy Graham. And the guy said, well, who's in the back? He, the governor? He's like, no. God, uh, he said, no. The, the president? No. He said, I think it's God himself that Billy Graham is driving around today. And I don't know if you know this or not, but when you give your life to Jesus Christ, God comes to live inside of you, and you become God's chauffeur. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you, and the calling that God has placed on your life is inside of you, and God is saying to you today that he wants you to understand that you have a magnificent calling on your life, that God has given you a great calling. Now, let me tell you something. Having a great calling and feeling great are two different things, right? I was playing basketball on Thursday and someone stepped on my left foot. I twisted my ankle and tweaked my back. I don't feel great, but I know I have a great calling on my life. I know God has called me to do great things for him and to be great for him, but there are times that we feel very limited, right, in who God has created us to be. So today I want to invite you to take your program, your Bible, or your internet device, and we're going to look at Ezekiel 2 and 3 today, and we're going to ask this question, how do we live out Jesus' great calling and commission on our lives? And while I do that, I want to invite you to be a virtual evangelist, and I want to give three shout-outs this morning. I want to begin with Tori. Uh, Tori, you continue to be in our prayers. We look forward to seeing you soon. Brother Jerry, you continue to be in our prayers, praying God's healing over your life. And also, we want to lift up Brother Sam this morning, one of our intercessors. Sam, we want you to know uh, that we're thinking of you. We miss you in the house and just pray God's healing over your life as well. Look at Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 1. God says to Ezekiel, Stand up. Stand up, son of man, said the voice. I want to speak with you. I want to talk to you. I want to tell you something. Wow, that's a moment. If God speaks to you and he says, stand up, okay, I'm standing. I want to tell you something. Okay, I'm listening. What do you want to say, God? The Spirit Ezekiel says, came into me as he spoke. He set me on my feet. And I listened, somebody say it, I listened how? Carefully. I listened carefully to his words. Now, I want you to notice something in, the, in this first verse. He refers to him as the son of man. And I want you to see something that we're going to see over and over again in the book of Ezekiel because most of us are very unfamiliar with this book. But the title that God gives Zeke, Ezekiel, is the same title that Jesus chooses for himself in the Gospels. When Jesus refers to himself, he most often refers to himself as the Son of Man. And God says to Ezekiel, 
some almost 600 years before the coming of Jesus, he says to him, stand up, son of man, I want to talk to you. Now, what does this phrase mean? Because I went back and I studied it because, honestly, I didn't know for sure what it meant. And basically, what most writers and and all the experts think is that Son of Man is simply a phrase that says that you are just like everybody else. You're trying to emphasize your humanity, your humanness. As we go through this life, you will eventually, if you serve God long enough, you will eventually get over yourself. You say, really? Yes, and everybody else will get over you before you get over you. And so just so you know, when you get over you, everybody's been waiting for that moment. And when that moment comes, you understand that like everybody else, you have clay feet, you're a human, and you're broken just like everybody else. But I want you to understand something. When you get to the moment when you're over yourself, God is the most excited about the commission and calling that he has on your life because you're now going to fix your eyes on him, the author and finisher of your faith, who for the glory uh, that was set before him endured the cross and is seated at the right hand of the Father and is making intercession on your behalf right now. And see, the greatest work that you're going to do in your life is when you reach the moment, you ready? When you reach the moment when you're tired of being a mom. When you reach the moment when you're tired of being a dad. When you reach the moment that you're tired, you fill in the blank. When you reach that moment, God is saying to us, I was waiting for you to get to this moment because I have a great calling and a great commission on your life, and I am going to do the greatest work through your life now. So how do we live out this great calling and commission? Number one, you listen carefully to his words to us. You listen carefully to his words to us. Not only... Do you listen, but you listen with great care? God, what are you wanting to say to me? Look at verse 3. Son of man, he said, I'm sending you to the nation of Israel, a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have been rebelling against me to this very day. They're stubborn, they're hard-hearted, but I'm sending you to say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Wow. Wow. And whether they listen, catch this, whether they listen or they refuse to listen, for remember, they're rebels, at least they'll know they've had a prophet among them. So here's the commission. The commission is, Zeke, I want you to go tell my people this message And I don't want you to focus on how they respond. You know how difficult that is? Do you have any idea how difficult it is to take a message from God to whoever God calls you to take it to, your child, your spouse, a loved one, a neighbor, whatever. And God is saying, Zeke, here is your commission. I want you to say this And I want you not to pay attention to how they respond because I want them to know that a prophet has been among them. Now, let's fast forward to now. That was Zeke's commission. What's our commission? What's our calling? What did Jesus tell the disciples? Look at Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, 
That's a powerful commission. And you might say to yourself, self, that's a fearful commission. What if I don't have what it takes? Well, look at what Zeke did. Look at verse 6. Son of man, do not fear them or their words. In order to do what God has called you to do, you've got to stop fixating on the fear that comes from what he's called you to do and the response that people may give. Don't be afraid even though their threats surround you like nettles and briars and stinging scorpions. Do not be dismayed by their dark scowls, even though they're rebels. So how do we live out this great calling and commission? Number two, you speak God's word to others, and this is the challenge, without fear. Without fear. When you speak what God has told you to speak, God expects you to speak it without fear. Now, you say, does that mean that we don't feel that anxiety? No. Here's what he's saying. Fear me more than you fear them. I heard a great definition this week. Thanks to Yvonne Alvarez, she sent me a sermon that I watched. And the pastor, Texas pastor, he said, do you know what it means to fear the Lord? I love this. It means to love what God loves and hate what God hates. And so how about you? Do you love what God loves? Do you hate what God hates in your life? The sin. Look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. Jesus sent out the 12 apostles with these instructions. Don't go to the Gentiles or the Samaritans, but only to the people of Israel. So this is where the gospel started with Jesus, God's lost sheep. Go and announce to them that the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cure those with leprosy, and cast out demons. Give as freely as you have received. He says, don't take any money in your money belts, no gold, silver, or even copper coins. Don't carry a traveler's bag with a change of clothes and sandals or even a walking stick. Don't hesitate to accept hospitality because those who work deserve to be fed. Whenever you enter a city or a village, search for a worthy person. Stay in his home until you leave town. And when you enter the home, give it your blessing. If it turns out to be a worthy home, let your blessing stand. If it's not, take back the blessing. If any household or town refuses to welcome you or listen to your message, shake its dust from your feet as you leave. I tell you the truth, the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah will be better off than such a town on this judgment day. Now look, I'm sending you as sheep among wolves. By the way, that's not fun. God says, I know I'm sending you into dangerous, difficult, and challenging moments. I want you to go anyway. I want you to go anyway. So here's how I want you to go. I want you to be as shrewd as snakes and as harmless as doves. I want you to be wise in how you go but I want you to go in such a way like a dove that you're trusting me that I'll take care of you. But beware, for you'll be handed over to the courts. You'll be flogged with whips in the synagogues. By the way, this happened to the disciples. You'll stand trial before governors and kings because you are my followers, but this will be your opportunity to tell the rulers and other believers about me. When you're arrested, can you imagine hearing those words, Becky? Becky? Hey, I'm going to send you out. I want you to go share the gospel when you are arrested. And you're like, let's stop right there on that phrase. When you are, what? Would you say that phrase again, Jesus? When you are arrested. Oh, okay. Well, I I don't plan on being arrested. I I don't want to be arrested. I'm not looking to be arrested. That's not why I signed up for this. And can you just imagine Jesus in that moment? He just goes on. Don't worry about how to respond or what to say. 
Oh, okay, so this is our game plan. Did anybody tell you, you, you know, hope's not a game plan, all right? It's not a strategy. And the Lord says, no, no, listen to me. When you are arrested, don't worry about what to say. You don't need to plan it out. I want to stop here just a second. Because this part is the hardest part for me, Tony. It's like, okay, Lord, you've told me something bad's coming. I got to get ready. And you're telling me not only is bad coming, but don't get ready. I'm really confused. I'm really confused. You go, me too. Okay, you're in a great place. You're in a great place for God to use your life. You go, well, if I'm in such a great place, why does it not feel great? Because the great God who created you has you at a place where you've recognized that the illusion of control is gone in your life, and now God is going to do a new work through you. He's going to do a new work through you. This isn't easy. God will give you the right words at the right time. For it's not you who will be speaking. It will be the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Now look at verse 21. We go back to Ezekiel. A brother will betray... uh, I'm sorry, we're we're still in Matthew. A brother will betray brother to death. A father will betray his own child. Children will rebel against their parents and cause them to be killed. And all nations will hate you because you are my followers. But everyone who endures to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one town, flee to the next. I tell you the truth. Here it is. The Son of Man will return before you've reached all the towns of Israel. Same title, same mission. And here is the commission that God gives us. We are to tell people about the good news, the salvation of Jesus Christ. And at the same time, we are to tell people about the impending eternal judgment that comes if people do not accept the good news, the salvation of Jesus Christ. That's our commission. It's twofold. The church can't just tell people the good news. Because if there is no bad news, Candace, there is no good news. So we have to tell the good news is this. You don't have to eternally live the bad news. But the bad news is if you don't accept the good news, the bad news is all you'll have for eternity. That's our commission. That's our calling. That's what God has asked us to do. You go, well, I don't like to do that because that makes me feel uncomfortable. Ezekiel 2.7. You must give them my message whether they listen or not. But they won't listen. I mean, God's not helping us out here. It's like, you're you to do this whether they listen or not, and I'm just telling you, they're not going to listen. They're completely rebellious. So how do we live out this commission and calling? Number three, give them God's message regardless of result. <coughs> give them God's message regardless of of result. And I just want you to know that I've had people in my life, one in particular that I shared the gospel with for 20 years, and he was very kind to listen to me share it. Pastor John Ellsbury was a part of the last time I shared it with him. Uh, And in 20 years, he said, no, 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 no. And as far as I know, he said no. And now he's gone. Our job, we cannot make people believe. That's not our commission. That's not our calling. But we are to be faithful to share the good news with people. Let them decide. Let them decide. Let them decide. Verse 8, son of man, listen to what I say to you. Do not join them in their rebellion. Isn't this interesting? I want you to see the sequential order of this. I want you to tell them the good news, and I want you to know up front they're not going to believe it. And then after they don't believe it, here's what I need to tell you. Don't join them in disbelieving. 
Do you know what disbelief does to us? Discourages us. It discourages us. And it causes us to want to join the rebellion of those that refuse to believe. But don't join them in it. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. So how do we live out this great calling and commission? Number four, resist the temptation to join their rebellion. Periodically in my life, I've been asked by God to do certain things. And I cannot tell you how many times uh, that I've done it and it hasn't turned out very well. And I've watched the Lord, and, and this, is, this is very difficult. I've watched the Lord, and I've said to the Lord, Lord, I did what you wanted me to do when you wanted me to do it. And the Lord's response is always the same, Tony. Great. Now wait on me. What? What? But when you do what God tells you to do, when God tells you to do it, Patty, you know what happens while you wait on God? You get to suffer the consequences of having told someone the truth. Isn't that exciting? I mean, isn't that great? Don't you want to sign up for this? When you do what God tells you to do, when he tells you to do it, you get to wait on him and suffer the consequences of having told someone the truth. And I want you to understand that that is, you ready? That is proof that what you told him was true. Because you're having to suffer for having told them the truth because this is the suffering they are going to face when God brings the consequence on them. And I want you to know that this is very difficult. It is very difficult to do what when God tells you to do it and then throw on the brakes, pump the brakes, and wait. 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 Verse 9, then I looked and I saw a hand reaching out to me. Oh, thank God. Thank God. It held a scroll which he unrolled, and I saw that both sides were covered with funeral songs, words of sorrow and pronouncements of doom. Chapter 3, the voice said to me, Son of man, eat what I'm giving you. Do you ever get tired of eating what God's giving you? Do you ever get tired? You go, God, I've already eaten that. I don't need to eat it again. Go and give its message to the people of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he fed me the scroll. Fill your stomach with this. And he said, and when I ate it, tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. How do we live out this commission and calling? Number five, you say what God tells you to say. You say what God tells you to say. You say, well, how do you know if it's God telling you to say something? Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you don't. But here's the question. If you say it, is it going to cost you? Well, yes. Then he's probably speaking. He's probably speaking. He said, verse 4, Son of man, go to the people of Israel and give them my messages. I'm not sending you to a foreign people whose language you can't understand. Boy, this is getting personal now. You ready, Vanguard? God wants you to go tell people you know the truth. So who in your life do you know that you're in relationship with that you ain't telling them the truth? You go, yeah, but I just love them. No, you don't. No, you don't. I'm not saying be a jerk, but God is saying to Zeke, this is personal. I want you to go talk to people you know about the truth. This is the great calling and commission on our lives. You go, yeah, I'd love to to go on a mission trip and go tell somebody overseas the truth. Okay, that's great, and that's wonderful, and let's do it, and I'm a part of it, and we've done it, and we'll do it again. 
But let's don't go tell people we don't know till we've told people we know. And see, God works through relationships. And God is wanting you to tell the people you know the truth about what you know. Look at Matthew 10, 24, don't, uh, 10, 34. Don't imagine that I came to bring peace to the earth. This is Jesus talking, by the way. This is a tough chapter. I came not to bring peace but a sword. I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Your enemies will be right in your own household. If you love your father or more than mother more than you love me, you're not worthy of being mine. Or if you love your son or daughter more than me, you're not worthy of being mine. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you're not worthy of being mine. If you cling to your life, you're going to lose it. If you give up your life, you're going to find it. Anyone who receives you receives me. Anyone who receives me receives the Father who sent me. If you receive a prophet as one who speaks for God, you'll be given the same reward as a prophet. If you receive righteous people because of their righteousness, you'll be given a reward like theirs. And if you give even a cup of cold water to the one of the least of my followers, you will surely be rewarded. So how do we live this calling and commission? Number six, you speak about God to, uh, you speak about God to those you know. You speak about God to those you know. You go, yeah, that's uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. Regardless of how many people you know in this life, and I think I've proved the point, like there's people in this room who go, how could anybody not know who Billy Graham is? But I learned many years ago, there's plenty of people who have no idea who that guy is. And no matter how, quote unquote, famous you become for God, God still needs other people. You're not the totality of God's commission and, and, and his calling. The body of Christ is. And God wants every one of us, and the reality is every one of us in this room and everyone watching online, we all have a network of people that we rub shoulders with every day. And more than likely, 90% of the people that you see in your day-to-day, -day, I don't ever see, and vice versa. I got in a conversation on Thursday uh, before basketball with this uh, guy named Dave, really nice guy, and I said, Dave, um, I'm just curious, and, and I always, I'm a little squirmish because, you know, I'm rather competitive on the basketball court, okay? Rather vocal. All right? I run my mouth up here. I run my mouth everywhere I go, all right? And I said, Dave, I'm just curious. Do you know what I do? Uh, and he's like, uh, yeah, I think so. I was like, he's like, you're a pastor, aren't you? I said, yeah. He's like, I have no idea where. And so I started describing where, and, and we're playing pickup basketball less than two miles from here. He had no idea this building even existed. And I said, well, I'd love for you to come and visit sometime. Let me know whenever you want to come. I said, do you go to church? He's like, nope, I don't go. Not at all. And my point is this. Every one of us rubs shoulders with somebody. And their names are different, their stories are different, but God has put you on planet earth where he's put you and the time he's put you there, and he wants you to understand whether you feel great or significant in the kingdom of God, he sees you as great and significant. He sees you as great and significant. And he wants you to use your life to advance the truth of who he is. Look at Ezekiel 3.6. I'm not sending you to people with strange and difficult speech. If I did, they wouldn't listen. But the people of Israel won't listen to you any more than they listen to me, for the whole lot of them are hard-hearted and stubborn. I don't know if you picked up on the subtlety of verse 7, so I just want to draw attention to it. God knows they're not going to listen to you about him because they won't listen to him from him. And there comes a point, and this is the tough part about the commission, is that sometimes God has us go talk to people he's already talked to because he wants to give them yet another chance to believe. 
because God is very long-suffering and he's very patient with people and he's very kind and he's very gentle. I mean, he is an amazing God. Look at verse 8, but look, I've made you obstinate, hard-hearted as they are. I've made your forehead as hard as the hardest rock. So don't be afraid of them. But I am, Lord. Don't fear their angry looks, but I do, Lord. Jesus and Zeke are speaking the same language here. And I think it's really important for you to see this. A lot of times Christians are like, let's don't read the Old Testament. That's not for today. I go, well, where do you get that? Because when you read Ezekiel, when you read Jesus, it sounds about the same. It sounds about the same. Look at verse 10. He added, son of man, let all words sink deep into your own heart first. Listen to them carefully for yourself. You know one of the ways you can know that God is speaking to you to say something to somebody else? He's saying it to you first. He's saying it to you first. Usually whatever God's trying to get you to go say to somebody else, he's trying to get you to listen as he says it to you first. And that's very humbling. Listen to them carefully for yourself. Verse 11, then go to your people in exile and say this to them. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Do this whether they listen to you or not. Now look at 1 Corinthians 9, 27. This is Paul talking. He says, I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. When something comes out of your mouth, it should first have been applied to your own life. And one of the commitments that I made to the Lord many years ago when I started pastoring was, Lord, if, if I teach on something that I'm not living, I'm going to talk about my struggle first. My struggle first. And it's really important, and I really hope that if you hear nothing else, you hear this today. When you go talk to people about truth the truth of God. Talk to them about the truth of God in your life first. Talk to them about your challenges. Talk to them about how it is difficult for you in this area or that area. Don't come as as if you've got it all figured out because we know you don't. Come with humility and share First of all, how God's word is affecting your life, and then secondarily, what God wants to say to them through you. So number seven, how do we live this calling and commission? Speak God's words first to yourself, then others. Speak God's words first to yourself, then others. Look at verse 12. Then the Spirit lifted me up. I heard a loud rumbling sound behind me. May the glory of the Lord be praised in his place. It was the sound of the wings of the living beings. And this goes back to the vision that he had last week that we talked about. They brushed against each other, the rumbling of their wheels beneath them. The Spirit lifted me up, took me away. I went in bitterness and turmoil. Did you catch that? That's that's what walking with the Lord, by the way, feels like sometimes. We go in bitterness and turmoil. But the Lord's hold on me was strong. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? I had to say to the Lord, and I keep saying to the Lord this year, I don't have the strength. I don't have the emotional bandwidth. I don't have the fight in me. If you want me to have it in me, you're going to have to give it to me because I don't have it. I don't have it. I don't have it. If you have more strength for me, Give it to me. Give it to me, Lord. Give it to me. Because the old wineskins are not good enough for the new wine strength that God has for us. And there are moments in our lives when we have to let go so that God can do a new work in us. 
I came to the colony of the Judean exiles in Tel Aviv beside the Kabar River. I was overwhelmed. I sat among them for seven days. After seven days, the Lord gave me a message. He said, Son of man, I have appointed you as watchman for Israel. Wherever you receive a message from me, warn people immediately. If I warn the wicked, saying you're under the penalty of death, but you fail to deliver the warning, they'll die in their sins, and I'll hold you responsible for their deaths. If you warn them and they refuse to repent and keep on sinning, they'll die in their sins, but you will have saved yourself because you obeyed me. If righteous people turn away from their righteous behavior and ignore the obstacles I put in their way and they will die, and if you do not warn them, they'll die in their sins, none of their righteous acts will be remembered and I'll hold you responsible for their deaths. But if you warn righteous people not to sin and they listen to you and do not sin, they'll live and you'll have saved yourself too. The Lord took hold of me and he said, get up, go out into the valley and I'm going to speak to you there. So I got up and I went. And there I saw the glory of the Lord. And just as I had seen in my first vision by the Kabar River, and I fell face down on the ground, and the Spirit came into me and set me on my feet. He spoke to me and said, Go to your house, shut yourself in. There, son of man, you'll be tied with robes so you cannot go out among the people. I'm going to make your tongue stick to the roof of your mouth so that you'll be speechless and unable to rebuke them for their rebels. But when I give you a message... I'm going to loosen your tongue. I'm going to let you speak. And then you're going to say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Those who choose to listen will listen. But those who refuse will refuse for they are rebels. So we've got to speak what God tells us to speak when he tells us to speak it. But here's the emphasis on this passage. And this is the hardest thing about walking with the Lord, in my opinion. Your reward for following God is not determined by people's response to the message that you give them. It is determined by your obedience to do what God has told you to do. Does that make sense? And you may find yourself discouraged by people's responses to the message that God has given you, the gospel that God has given you to give to people. But God is not going to reward you based off of how they respond. He's going to reward you based off of your faithfulness to do what he told you to do. So here's number eight. Speak out of obedience regardless of their response. Speak out of obedience regardless of their response. If you don't speak, God's going to hold you accountable. If you speak, he's going to hold them accountable. And so I want to encourage you, in, in my good old Southern Baptist roots, I was taught, don't die with the blood of other people's lives on your hands. And then somewhere along the way we go, well, no, that's not the gospel. Jesus would never. Well, I don't know. Like, like if, there's two things I hope doesn't happen in eternity to me. The first one is I hope I don't get to heaven and I see somebody in hell that I hear say to me, why didn't you tell me about Jesus? But then the other awkward moment is going to be when I get to heaven. If I see people in heaven who go, well, why didn't you tell me about Jesus? Why did somebody else have to tell me? Why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me? And so I just want to tell you something. You can do whatever you want with your life. You can be as important as you think you are or as unimportant as you think you are. But when you get to heaven... The only thing that's going to matter is what you did with Jesus and how you communicated it to others as well. That's it. This is the great calling and the great commission that Jesus has given us. Amen? Amen. And may God give us the grace to love people into a real relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, 
This is your word. This is your commission. Every one of us. And I just want to give a, a, a shout out. If Maybe you're sick right now. Maybe you can't even come to church, but you do have to go to the doctor. You do have to see a nurse. You do have to see uh, this and that. Every time you see somebody, as difficult as your life may be right now, you have an opportunity to share the gospel. You can live in your own head and make it all about the pain of your life. That's your choice. But God is asking right now in the season that you're in, will you offer me your pain and look for somebody to share me with? This is the calling and the commission on all of our lives who claim the name of Jesus. May God give us the grace to live this great calling even when we don't feel great. May God give us the courage to be courageous even when our fear is overwhelming us. May God give us the strength after we've spoken what he wants us to say, when he wants us to say it, May he give us strength we don't have to wait on him. Lord, you are an unlimited strength God. You're the best strength coach out there. Increase our strength in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, amen. amen.